Welcome back. I'm Barry Craig. Back in the 1920s, a man named Fred Newman wrote a book called Paducans in History. My two guests today have an idea to maybe not do a book, but a booklet highlighting Paducans who have sort of fallen through the cracks of history, Paducans uh, who, who are not as well known. They are John Robertson, a uh, former professor at the college, and I think we could call John Paducas unofficial historian, and Alan Rhodes, who is also an historian in his own right. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you. What exactly do you all have in mind? I, I know we're not talking about a tome here. We're talking more of a pamphlet, but just tell us what you have in mind. Well, it occurred to me that the only two people everybody seems to know about are Barclay and Cobb, and that uh, there has to be a lot more to Paducah history than that. And so I talked to John, and we decided we wouldn't publish a book, but we would publish a pamphlet, maybe available to the Chamber of Commerce and Tourist Bureau and the Redcoats, and a handout piece, maybe to the schools, that could uh, describe some of these people that are important uh, in Paducah history and who made a significant contribution, uh, not, not just people that happened to drop by here, people who lived here. The rule was they had to, be li they had to live here and of course they had to be dead. Well that, 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 can, <laughs> that can be good. <laughs> well it's surprising too the, the gamut of skills and what all these people did ranging from uh, pioneers who uh, you know, made uh, national news like the Clark Brothers and on down to, uh, well, I was last night on internet and pulled up my Google just to see if I could find uh, a, sour, uh, a site for a Paducah uh, institution. At one time, it was the second largest Wild West show in the United States. And this was because uh, uh, well, Buffalo Bill was in Europe at the time, and Pawnee Bill was someplace else. And this housed here in Paducah and uh, on a farm in Bowdery County, Buckskin Bill Wild West Show. Out of a million hits on Google, it was not mentioned once. So something has fallen through the cracks. And that's the sort of thing we want to, to look at, things which were significant. Uh, not only on a local level, but on a national level. Mm -hmm. At the same time, uh, you know, uh, perhaps some of them, even like uh, like Cobb. Uh, Mr. Rhodes was mentioning as we were coming out that uh, Cobb uh, at one time was one of the the more important writers we had in, Purdue, in the United States. Mm -hmm. But people don't know him anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I had been, we were talking about the program, that Cobb was the highest paid writer in America in the 20s. And that says a lot. There mm -hmm. were a lot of famous writers with very facile pens, and here this man from Paducah. Uh, and I would also submit that Cobb and Barclay are even underappreciated in Paducah today. I, I, I wonder how many Paducans actually know much about e even those two guys. Now, you all would welcome um, submissions from citizens of Paducah if they have an idea. How about this or how about that? And we'll start by giving John's number, and we'll do it again. And your telephone number, if someone wanted to contact you all about this project, they could phone. 270-444-7753. Here in Paducah. Now, let's run a list. You all have sort of drawn up a preliminary list of mm -hmm. people. Who are some of these folks? <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say, we, we have to sort of bend the rules a little bit. We've got to put Speedy on there. Right. Well, <laughs> tell that story. <laughs> <coughs> well, Speedy came to Paducah, I think, uh, with a traveling carnival. You know, he, uh, I think one story is he was a high diver, and he got tired of jumping 70 feet into a, a damp sponge mm -hmm. and decided he'd retire in Paducah. And he became a local handyman noted for running around quickly and doing everything, you know, quickly, uh, except when he went fishing. And then he liked to mellow out. And in 1928, he went down uh, on the coal tipple fishing <coughs> and took him a, a, well, I think it was some white lightning and he fell in and drowned. Well, uh, no one claimed the body, so Mr. Hummock from the uh, Hummock Funeral Home mm -hmm. uh, asked if he could have the body and he did something he could never or didn't duplicate again. 
he turned Speedy into a mummy. And Speedy, who died in 1928, appeared on national television, mm -hmm. on That's Incredible, mm -hmm. and actually flew out to California, mm -hmm. uh, occupying a seat on a jet airliner. Mm -hmm. So, you know, here is a, a person that for a while became one of Paducah's, well, tourist attractions. Mm -hmm. They would take tours through, take children out of school and bring them down to see this Mm -hmm. This mummified. Uh, now he was since buried. He, he since has yes. been buried. Yes. yes, yes. So besides Speedy Atkins, who else? Well, and this is mainly John's list, I guess. Caesar Caskell. Caesar uh, Caskell. Now that story is not very well known. Tell us the story of Caesar Caskell. On 1862, U.S. Grant put out an order. He was tired of what he called Jew peddlers meddling with affairs down in Mississippi. So he ordered all Jews as a class expelled, which meant everybody in his command, even his own troops. And so as a result, in Paducah, quite a few were uh, rounded up, put on a boat, and sent out of Kentucky. Cincinnati, I believe. Cincinnati uh, is where Caesar and uh, David Wolfe and uh, another Casco went to see John Gourley, who was the congressman, and they got on another boat and went to Washington and on a Sunday afternoon met with Abraham Lincoln, and the next day that order was rescinded. And that's the most blatant example of anti-Semitism by an official of the United States to date. Mm -hmm. And so Caesar Casco mm -hmm. stopped that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let's just run the list. This will be, this will be oh, interesting. Oh, Big House Gaines. Sonny Hawes. Uh, Basketball. Tell us about them because now again, Big House Gaines has been away from here a long time. Now, and he is dead now. He is, of course, yes, he is. He, he's mm -hmm. dead. And of course, Sonny Hawes is too. Uh, but uh, these two were uh, able to achieve national significance in their respective sports. Mm -hmm. Big House Gaines uh, was at uh, Goes. Goldsboro, North Carolina, I believe Yes, it was. It, was, it was North Carolina. And he uh, was one of the winningest coaches in college basketball. Yes. I think only Adolph Rupp and uh, Not sure. maybe two or three others. Yeah, he had something like 900 wins, wasn't it? Or something 800, like that. So. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. And his mother ran a hotel here in Paducah. Now, which is being restored, the it's Metropolitan. Being in the Metropolitan it certainly hotel. is. Uh -huh. Sonny Halls, of course, brought PJC a national mm -hmm. Basketball right. championship from Paducah. To and he also saw to it that several people in this area got into professional baseball. So uh, at one time, Paducah Junior College also had the first intercollegiate, uh, well, team. It was a rifle team. And men and women competed on the same team. I didn't know about that. And nobody does. Yeah. yeah. But it was a, a groundbreaker. Lynn Boyd. Speaker of the House. Many from years. From Paducah, yeah. Kentucky. He moved here from uh, uh, Trigg County. He was a congressman for the first district. In 1850, the country was about to fall apart over slavery. And Lynn Boyd, as a Democrat, got together with uh, uh, Henry Clay, a Whig senator, and they, they saw to it that a bill was put through the Congress that saved the Union for 10 years, the Compromise of 1850. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so for... His role in that event, they made him the Speaker of the House of Representatives for two terms. Mm -hmm. Then he left uh, because of health reasons. He moved to Paducah, and while he was here, uh, he was elected as Lieutenant Governor of Kentucky mm -hmm. in 1859, and he died before he could be sworn in. Mm -hmm. So, boy, and he's buried in uh, Old Grove Cemetery. Mm -hmm. And what's fascinating, I, I remember seeing his tombstone, and there is no mention of any of this. And didn't you tell me, John, the tombstone was broken and that part got away? Or That sounds familiar. Somebody but, told mm -hmm. me that, yeah. that because I thought, this is so ironic. Here's this man who was a Speaker of the House, and it's not mentioned on his tombstone. And someone told me that's because that part was broken away. So you look mm -hmm. at this man, Lynn Boyd, you think, well, he was just some man named Lynn Boyd. There used to be a historical marker down on Broadway down about the... Yeah. Wasn't his house in that general area? Yeah. 
It's exactly. not on Kentucky Avenue. Um, was it on Kentucky? Yeah, it was over there uh, uh, about 15th or so in through there, and it was torn down. Uh, but, uh, well, we've had, uh, I always think that somebody ought to remember uh, 3Q, if nothing else, for his name. Oh, yeah. Quintus? Quintus? Quincy Quigley. Quigley. Mm hmm he was the lawyer who wrote the, uh, uh, well, the Constitution of the City of Paducah, actually, in corporation as a second-class city. But he was also kept uh, a journal all during the Civil War. Yes. And so he, uh, his, some of his insights are quite... Uh, Q, Q. Quigley. Yeah. Didn't he also own the house that Barclay bought, Angles? Yes. He was the one who built right. it there. Mm -hmm. Built it. Yeah. And, that's and he called it Angles because he had three or four tracts of land and all came together at a point, I believe, and he gave it that name. What a great name. Q -Q Getting up to more modern times, uh, an overlooked Paducan is Red Dr. Red Robertson. Absolutely. Order, Order of the British, of the Empire. British Empire. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. Signed and to King George himself. First, uh, first surgeon that ever came to Paducah. Is Pi that right? Yeah, pioneer. And of course, his, his, uh, uh, he was with the troops at Anzio. Yes. And the British had taken a lot of injuries, apparently, and they didn't have a doctor. So he was assigned to the British. Mm -hmm. uh, here's an American doctor working on the British soldiers. And he stayed with them for a long time, mm -hmm. maybe a year. Mm -hmm. And then that, that's the background for him being invited to England every whip stitch. He went over many times to visit with his old friends, and mm -hmm. they arranged for him to meet mm -hmm. the Queen. and. Yes. Order of the British Empire. He was in the Royal College of Surgeons. Okay. Uh, uh, but uh, I saw, I, I was fortunate to, to interview him once and to go to his house and see this OBE, which is a huge, huge, enormous certificate. And it's, of course, got the ribbon and then the, and, and it's signed George, just about that big <laughs> king. And I don't know how many OBEs you have in the state of Kentucky, but I dare say not many. Uh, uh, well, I, don't I don't think know. any. Yeah, he's got to be either. either it's either. the highest honor they can give to anyone who's not yeah. from I mean, England. It, it was just, yeah. He'd be a great guy. He, he'd be, and, and, and I believe he told me, uh, and you might check this out, that he kept very detailed records on all of his operations, on uh, the various uh, removals. And I, one he told me about, uh, in fact, I think it was a German soldier, that the man was shot in the leg and the bullet went all the way up and lodged in his chest and he had a devil of a time finding where this bullet went. And he wrote about that. I mean, it's an incredible account. And I mean, under fire, this is all while they're being shelled. It's an amazing story and you're right. Who knows about Red Robertson? That's a great one. That's a great one. Well, certainly we shouldn't forget Dolly. No. The first woman to be oh, Dolly a mayor Absolutely. of a second-class city Absolutely. in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Absolutely. Old Madam Eloquent herself, mm -hmm. one of the great speakers of our times, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. uh, we, we must not forget the ladies. Mm -hmm. Who else? This is an interesting list oh, so far. There's lots of them on here. <laughs> uh, Albert Thompson, Emily Jarrett, Eamon King. Well, we said Eamon. Well, let's go back. Crowns. George Crown. Sure. Back to Albert Thompson. Is it true that when they were storming the Fort Fort Anderson, that a cannonball blew his head off? I've heard two different versions of that. One that uh, uh, not only hit it, but it knocked his spine out and sat on the ground and jumped up and down. <laughs> I've heard uh, that too. I've heard that. that heard uh, that from a, a barber in Golconda, who was his his grandfather was at the fort and he told me that his grandfather looked over the rampart, <laughs> saw the cannonball hit him, it ripped the spinal column out and he said his words was it coiled up like a snake. Now he must have had a tremendous pair of eyes to see <laughs> that. Oh. Oh, well, those things always grow after the fact. Yeah, yeah. But uh, one account I read by a, by a person in his uh, outfit was that he was shot and fell out of the saddle. Uh, so apparently it was a musket ball rather than a cannonball. I don't okay. know. But that's a tremendous, that's an old Paducah legend. I've always been interested in John Scopes, and I yes. met him on my list, and he said, well, you've forgotten his Lila, Lila Scopes. And I said, well, who is she? No. His sister. His yeah. sister who was kicked out of Augusta Tillman 
high school for teaching evolution before John Thomas even went to Tennessee to take a job. Is that right? And John Thomas, of course, was the test case yeah. that made national news and plays mm -hmm. and movies and everything have come out of the, the famous Daryl uh, Bryan confrontation at the mm -hmm. Scopes trial. And this truly was one of the trials of the century, so it called. It was world yeah. famous. And he was the defendant. And his sister, well, no like one ever mentioned her. The, all the news media were there. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And they were seeing their little messages back by telephone and telegraph, I guess. Yeah, yeah. It was an, and, and, and <clears throat> well, I talk about that trial, and, and, and you're right. No one's ever heard of this man. Well, and, Henry and, Mencken, you know, uh, the Serbic. The, the bad boy of Baltimore. The bad boy of press right. took it on as his personal cause. Yeah. And his newspaper, the Baltimore Sun, paid the fine of John Thomas mm -hmm. Scopes. Hundred dollars. Hundred dollars. That's right. That's right. But the strangest thing about that to me is that when his family immigrated here from England, they brought a couple of chests of books with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, in one chest was the Book of Common Prayer. There was uh, two Bibles, and there was uh, uh, the Origin of the Species. Mm. And didn't you tell me once that when, when of course, the, the, the uh, special prosecutor in the trial was William Jennings Bryant, Bryant came to Paducah to oh, speak Chautauqua. Uh, Chautauqua to speak against evolution, and the Scopeses were in the audience? Uh, that's what the Scopes family told me. He said uh, they were there. I don't know whether John Thomas was, but uh, his sister and uh, her mm -hmm. parents were there. And I was fortunate enough to interview her, interview her once, and uh, she was very secretive, very quiet about this. And so... I asked her, I said, well, Miss Scopes, how did John wind up at Ray County High School in Dayton, Tennessee? Well, he was a pre-law major and had come down with an illness. I don't know what it was, but he decided that he didn't have the physical stamina to, to enroll in law school. So she said, I'll get you a job teaching. And she did. She applied, got him the job. And I said, well, why Ray County, Tennessee? And she said, well, it was a quiet little place where I thought John couldn't possibly get any trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, okay, who else on that list? Well, uh, let's see here. Lloyd Tillman. Pappy. Civil, let's go. It's Lloyd Tillman, Civil War general. Uh, and, and now John in the past has not been kind to Lloyd Tillman. He said that here this man, he was this, he surrendered and... Tell us about Lloyd Tillman. <laughs> <laughs> well, Lloyd Tillman, uh, the best assessment of Lloyd Tillman was by... I was hoping uh, to bring this up. Mr. Johnson, who was the, the so-called governor of the Confederate state of Kentucky. George W. When he was behind the federal, uh, Confederate lines at Bowling Green. And he never interfered in military matters. But when Tillman came back from after he'd been captured by Grant at Fort Henry and was paroled... Uh, Governor Johnson wrote and said, this man should never be given a command. I don't know, but uh, he did very proper. Uh, he knew he couldn't defend the fort right. because of the rising water. And so he had everybody to leave, and he got his men out. That's good. And then he comes back and was sit there. He was firing a cannon, having a big time. And so he got called and had to surrender. So mm -hmm. he was the first Confederate general to surrender to Grant. And of course he was killed in the Vicksburg campaign. He, Champions he fought Hill. bravely, but in that battle where he was killed, he stopped to sight a cannon again. Right. That man had a fixation yeah. on artillery. He did, a cannon fetish or something. Yeah. Right, right, yeah. Well, uh, I, I And a statue of him, of course, on Fountain Avenue, the big, the big, Blue's mm -hmm. roundabout, the circle there, yeah. so. And who else? Oh, uh, Walter Jeton. William. You mentioned we should also include Luther. Luther. Carson. Oh, yes. Carson. Now, tell me, tell us about his connection to Coca-Cola. Wasn't he really on the ground, on the ground floor of Coca-Cola? Well, as I understand it, uh, uh, it was his brother, I believe, who went to a baseball game in Chattanooga and happened to sit next to a fellow who got to talking about Coca-Cola, that he had the franchise for it in that area and that he could give him the franchise for Western Kentucky and Southern Illinois or Southern Indiana. And he literally 
he did and he came back and started peddling Coca-Cola smut cart. Uh, all because he, he loved baseball. And it became wow. one of the world's favorite or best known drinks. Sure. And the Carson franchise continued to hold here and expand. And uh, they became benefactors to the community. But uh, as I remember, the man who actually invented Coke didn't get much out of it. That's Mr. Was that Candler? Uh, yes, he, Asa Candler. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, the old Coca-Cola plant here is just is a wonderful old building, yeah. especially at night, the way it lit up, and, and that's a terrific thing. Well, that fountain in there always fascinated children. You'd go in, and the fountain would be running with pure Coke. Oh, you could take boy. your glass and get you a... Oh, oh yeah. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Were you going to mention Pappy DePee by any chance a yeah. ago? Tell us about him, John. Well, he was a slave uh, who was a preacher for a Baptist minister at, uh, uh, what was it, Green Grove, I believe it is, in Lexington. And um, his, his constituency, which were slaves, approached his owner and offered to buy him on time. And the man agreed. And so for a period of several years, they paid small donations and actually purchased uh, his freedom. And then uh, after the war uh, in 1865, the 13th Amendment, when slavery officially ended, well, he moved to Paducah and was uh, a leader in establishing of black churches here and across the country. So... Uh, in Washington he, Street Missionary Baptist. Well, is, is the founding church here. Right. And when he uh, presided there, um, he also gave an image that the young people respected. He carried a big stick, mm -hmm. like Teddy Roosevelt in a mm -hmm. way, mm -hmm. and he uh, was respected and later was made a doctor and uh, uh, founded other churches here and in Missouri and died, I believe, in Missouri. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who else? This is a very good list. Oh, Ed Paxton, Henry Burdett, Tom Waller, now, Ed Paxton, which Ed Paxton? The original. The original, Ed Paxton The founder Sr. of the, well, of the Paxton time, Empire. Uh, yeah, Paxton <laughs> Empire, but also of uh, Citizens Savings Bank. And mm. when the, all the banks failed in Paducah during the Great Depression, two survived. First National and little bitty tiny Citizens. And then citizens moved in and bought the 10-story building of the Old City National mm -hmm. and became the largest bank in western Kentucky. Well, I said that's an aspect of him. I mean, you think of him as founding the Paducah Sun back in the 1890s, wasn't it? Uh, starting starting the, 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 the newspaper. But the bank, is that's, that's mm -hmm. a really interesting, yeah. uh, interesting aspect, too. And the other names you mentioned were, I believe you mentioned Tom Waller. Tom Waller. Oh, yeah. Well-known mayor. No. no, no lawyer. No. Lawyer. I, wasn't there a lawyer, a, a mayor here in Paducah named Waller? Well, I'm from Mayfield. You have to excuse uh, there me. You go. There you well, go. Well, uh, if you look right over your shoulder here on the campus of Paducah uh, College, which is now West Kentucky uh, Technical College, you'll see Waller Hall. Right. And it was named for, at that time, the he was on the original board that founded Paducah Junior College. In 1932, 1932. Right. and served continuously. And he was a famous raconteur. He told many stories that still, uh, uh, well, are well remembered throughout Western Kentucky. Okay. And of course, another one that, we, uh, that he crossed with uh, during his career was D. H. Anderson. Yes. Who founded uh, the first education institution for higher education in Western Kentucky. Mm -hmm. That was uh, uh, West Kentucky Industrial College in mm -hmm. 1907 mm -hmm. to train black teachers. And, and he literally dug the foundation. He dug the, the foundation for the first building himself. Mm -hmm. And he was trying to get money and he, uh, uh, he went to Frankfurt begging the governor to give him some and then he got a little bit and he was accused of misusing it, and Tom Waller became his attorney. And Waller went before the, the court and explained, said, well, uh, <laughs> there was money, it was uh, to be for a roof. No, it, it was to be for books for the library. But the library leaked. 
And so Mr. Anderson put a roof on the library with the funds. And the state was charging him with misappropriation of funds. Oh. And Mr. Walter said, well, it's like scrambled eggs. It's all there, but you just can't identify each particular piece. So he wow. used the funds wisely, and he got him off. Tom Waller. Tom Waller. Okay. Who else? We're about running out of time, but let's, we'll go until they make us quit. Henry Burdett. Now, I'm afraid I don't know Henry Burdett. You know Henry Burdett better than anybody else around here. He was a congressman from the first congressional Oh, Burnett. I beg your Burnett. pardon. I said Burdett. I think I did. Speak. I beg your pardon. Henry C. Burnett. Burnett. Yes, absolutely. I've got you. The, the, no. the, the man elected to the federal congress is a confederate, which is <laughs> kind of hard to figure. Right. From The Cadiz. only person to be kicked out of the House yes. of Representatives. Absolutely. Absolutely. And he also uh, was involved in that little thing that happened over there at Mayfield. The yes, secession. the secession convention when that was discussed. Mm -hmm. Time is running short. Let's keep running down the list until he makes us quit. Well, how about some new ones? All right. Uh, I mean, leader ones. Uh, Whitlow. McMurray. Attorneys. Uh, Joaquin Seltzer. Okay. Toot Smith. Now, I'm afraid you lost me on Joaquin Seltzer and Toot Smith. Uh, Joaquin Seltzer was an attorney here, among other things. She was in banking. And uh, she did have a law degree, I believe. She was the first woman banker. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. She was the number two person at Peoples. Okay. And Toot Smith, you said? Du Bois. Oh, sorry. Founded Du Bois Drug Company. The drug company, yes. Yes, yes. yes. And they owned the Smith Place that is now the... Whitehaven. That's Whitehaven. right. Uh -huh. That's right. Okay, that family. Okay. And the Whitehaven, of course, originally was in the Anderson family, and that was related to the commander of the federal troops that, uh, uh, when they fired on Fort Sumter. Robert Anderson. Robert Anderson. And, of course, he was a Kentuckian, and some mm -hmm. of them got down to Paducah. Yeah. Absolutely mm -hmm. fascinating. Well, I've been given the one-minute signal, which means we've got to wrap up or they'll come and wrap us <clears> up. <throat> we need to encourage people to send names to us. Absolutely. Uh, and and, and so call at 270 444 Seven seven five three, and so if they want, they can just submit a name. They don't have to submit a biographical. Sketch. Well, a little bit they whatever they happen well, to know. Exactly, exactly as as to who who they are, and uh, any target date when you would like to see this published. No, next week. No, we'll have to have a little while. <laughs> I'd say it'll be six months. And uh, again, we're, what we're envisioning here is a, is a booklet, a paperback. Uh, pictures would be nice. Uh, and, of course, John has some experience in that with the, the wonders of digital photography and all that stuff. I mean, you can, you can uh, do, this, do this sort of thing. And, again, uh, hopefully be available at the Chamber of Commerce and various places around town, and people can have this. And uh, uh, I think it would be interesting. And once it's done, we'll have to have you all back, and then you can take credit for your, <laughs> for your great, great work. So we're out of time. I'm Barry Craig. My guests today were John Roberts and Alan Rhodes. Uh, Thank you for joining us, and we will see you next time.